want to say I'm glad to be back. Appreciate that Brant takes time off so that I can have something to do. <laughs> and I want to thank you as a congregation for your great singing. Ours is a faith that sings, and a faith that does not sing is a faith not worth having. So it's a joy to have a singing congregation to lead us in worship. A new year has arrived with all appropriate ceremony, but our thoughts cling to peace on earth and goodwill to all. Just before Christmas, I reread the book, C.S. Lewis, children's story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It has a surprising amount to say about peace on earth. It is an allegory of the story of Christ, wherein Christ is depicted by the lion Aslan. The story takes place in the context of the bombing of London during World War II. Four siblings are sent to the country to stay with an elderly professor for their safety. And in the midst of a game of hide and seek, the youngest, Lucy, hides in a wardrobe, a very special wardrobe, which opens out into the land, to the woods of the land of Narnia. Clearly, C.S. Lewis wrote this tale to help children find hope in the midst of death and destruction and to suggest a way forward to peace. It's been winter in Narnia for 100 years, but in all this time, Father Christmas has been out of work. Christmas has not come to Narnia. This is because the white witch, servant of the evil emperor, has reigned in Narnia. She is a vicious queen, delighting in every opportunity to deep freeze her subjects with a wave of her wand. Narnia has been awaiting the arrival of the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, the human ones, in fulfillment of an ancient prophecy that their appearance would coincide with Aslan's march against the evil witch. Now, Edmund is the recalcitrant sibling of the bunch. He gives his allegiance to the white witch in exchange for a promise a promise of power to rule over his elder brother, Peter, with whom he was not getting along so well at the time, along with the promise of an endless supply of Turkish delight. When Edmund realizes the error of his ways, he is rescued, he escapes to return to Aslan's camp and is offered forgiveness there but the white witch invokes what she calls the deep magic of Narnia, the laws that were laid down from the beginning of time. The deep magic is written on a table of stone, a sacrificial altar. The witch confronts Aslan, telling him, you know that every traitor belongs to me as my lawful prey, and that for every treachery I have a right to kill. And so the human creature is mine. His life is forfeit to me. His blood is my property. Now, as just an evangelical Christian, I would read this and find support for a belief that this is a story about all of us being sinners, just like Edmund. I would be thinking that the white witch got it right and that just as Edmund needs to pay for his sin with his blood, so too the the rest of us face the same fate. In other words, I would be thinking that this was all part of God's plan. And the evil witch, curiously, is part of that plan. I'd be thinking she got it right. We deserve to die for our sin. But at this point in the story, the bull, one of Aslan's disciples, we might say, challenges the witch to try to take Edmund. She snarls, fool, do you really think that your master can rob me of my rights by mere force? He knows the deep magic better than that. He knows that unless I have blood, as the law says, all Narnia will be overturned and perish in fire and water. Again, I could read this and be thinking, ah, yes, this is why Jesus had to die and why God didn't rescue Jesus by force. It was all part of a divine plan. But 
I don't think either C.S. Lewis' tale or the Gospels support this take on the story. The White Witch is working from an old script. She is articulating what we should call the myth of redemptive violence. In its broad form, this myth says that a little violence judiciously employed is the best way to control the potential for greater violence. In its more specific form, the myth advocates the slaughter of an innocent victim as a way of making sure the violence does not escalate out of control. When Caiaphas says in the gospel story, referring to Jesus' execution, it is better that one man should die rather than a whole nation, Caiaphas is articulating the myth of redemptive violence. The belief is that when the mob witnesses the execution, they'll experience both a cathartic release, be sobered by the violence of the act, or more to the point, will fear it. Enough to dissuade them of further escalation. Well, this is what the witch means when she says that unless she has Edmund's blood, all of Narnia will be overturned and perish in fire and water. So this is the deep magic of the evil emperor, the myth of redemptive violence. But here's the rub. She got it wrong, didn't she? And I think that C.S. Lewis, perhaps unconsciously because he was writing for children, got it right. Aslan intervenes with a deeper magic, hidden from the witch. The witch's magic only goes back to the dawn of time. She thinks hers is an eternal law, but actually it was instituted by the evil emperor. In other words, it was a temporary magic, a cultural contrivance, not instituted by God at all. History is the story of humanity waiting for the deeper magic to manifest itself. The deeper magic is stated by Aslan after he is killed by the witch. For you see, he's put himself in Edmund's place. And he comes back to life. And he says, the witch's knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time. But if she looked back further into the stillness and the darkness before time dawned, she would have read there a different incantation. She would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. Aslan's act of love, transforming the violence of the witch into his own suffering on behalf of Edmund, puts an end to the queen's magic. It is his love, not the exchange of his blood for another, that breaks the spell of violence. The sacrificial altar is broken in two. The myth of redemptive violence shattered once and for all by the power of nonviolent, self-giving love. In Narnia, the moment of Aslan's death is the moment death itself is reversed. The winter gives way to spring. All those frozen by the white witch come back to life. Christmas becomes possible again. In the gospel story, the moment of Christ's death has that, is that moment in history when the cries of all the innocent victims of violence are gathered up and given divine precedence. The chilling spell cast by the myth of redemptive violence is revealed as a sham. This is the deepest of all magic the power of love to end violence. This is what we've been waiting for. In John's Gospel, it's called the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is the eternal meaning, capital M. We could even say in the beginning was the meaning of life, 
and the meaning of life was with God and the meaning of life was God. This orders the universe towards which the whole universe is headed and that meaning of life is love. The word became flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus of Nazareth. He is the fully human one we had been waiting for. The one who would bring an end to the belief in violence as the foundation upon which civilization must be constructed. God's message in Jesus Christ is it is love and love alone which will give birth to a new humanity made known in the sons and daughters of the new Adam. We are the ones the Christ has been waiting for to be the word, the meaning of life made flesh in our day and age. Well, here we are. A new year, 2015, with much, of course, to be grateful for, wonderful gifts, the love of family and friends, and abundance of good food. But this doesn't constitute what Christ came to give us, does it? He adds another dimension for those who savor the mystery of the Word made flesh. He adds the deepest of all magic which C.S. Lewis tried to get at in a children's story and what the author of John's Gospel tries to get at in his opening chapter. The deepest magic of all, that the Word which was in the beginning with God and was God, who became flesh of our flesh and dwelt among us, is the key to peace on earth. He is Jesus the Christ. And he came to break the spell we live under. He comes to us still, but we still scarcely know him because we live in the darkness of a spell, bound by our addicted appetites to buy more things, and trapped in violence to feed and protect that appetite. Christ comes to end the winter of our lives, to thaw our hearts and reverse the spiritual death to break the sacrificial altar upon which we throw ourselves to false gods. This morning, this year, remember that for you, spiritual freedom is possible and that a world without violence is possible. Christ demonstrated it. The deepest magic is loosed upon this planet and no power can stand before the word made flesh 2,000 years ago and again at the breaking out of a new year 2015 as we remember as we make it our own please join me in prayer Eternal God of the covenant, we praise your name for your work of salvation, a gift from you, sending us Jesus as the promise of peace. Fill us with the presence of your living spirit and give us wisdom to live in the light of that gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand together and affirm the faith of the church in the word.